believe in the miraculous. You got to believe that God raised him from the dead. Now, that's about the most miraculous it can be. You got to believe that he can change a life. You got to believe that he can cleanse you from all sins. It's not just simply believe. It's believe in something that has some substance that can really change a man's heart. That change this world to being a different kind of world into the kingdom of God. Now, Romans 10, 14 through 9, I, I went on, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, and expounds on the responsibility that we have to tell others. How can they call in whom they have not believed? How can they believe in whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching? How can they preach unless somebody sent? And it concludes it with verse 17 and saying, So, faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. Now, I do want to right here at this point use my theology degree, and that is this. And the ESV uses the phrase, the word of Christ. If you have a King James, it's the word of God. Big difference in the Greek, it says Christ. Why would that be different, and why would that be important? Well, there is a real importance to it, you see, for faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? The words of God and the words of Christ are different. The words of God in the Old Testament, the words of Christ are in the New Testament. The words of God in the Old Testament was sin damns you. For the wages of sin is death. But the words of Christ is what? Believe in me and you'll be forgiven. Now, you see, that's really powerful and that's why it's important. So faith comes by hearing And what really changes a man? Believing that sin condemns you? No, believing that Christ can change you. And that's why why I am an ESV or or NIV, and both of them will use this. It's the words of Christ. Now, we're going to take the next few verses, finish chapter 10, the tonight, chapter 11. Chapter 11 is, what's Israel's future? Uh, you know, and, and that they've heard all this and what, what's going to happen to them. But today, we're going to take verse 18 through 21. How then do we glorify God? How do we glorify God? Do you know how many songs we sing, Billy, that talk about glory to God? One of the songs, second song, I think it was, talks about glory to him. What's it mean to glorify? We've made that our statement of purpose. Whatever you do, what? Do all to the glory of God. What's that mean? What's it mean to do all to the glory of God? Now, see, you all have different interpretations. If we want a Bible study, I'd say, okay, everybody, let's just share. What's your kind of concept of this? What are you thinking right there? But we don't have time for that because I'll never get through the message. So I'm going to skip that part and go on. And I come to number one, and that's this. I, I asked, do you get it? Now, that's my interpretation. That's Glenn Stern's translation of verse 18. Look at verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? But indeed they have. Their voice has gone out all to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Stop there. Some of you are right confused. Well, what's he going to all these verses for? And whatever. He's going to cite three different Old Testament passages and we're going to deal with them. You see, I first of all looked at this and I thought, okay, what is he really trying to say in the simplest terms? And uh, I saw where he's saying, but I asked, have they not heard? Heard what? Have they not heard? And he talked about hearing. Hearing what? Well, they, who are they, first of all? Well, they is you and me, Jew, Gentile, Gentile, all people. Heard, heard what? Heard what God has said? Heard what God has designed? Heard what God has for our life? Heard what God's desire and purpose is for man? How do I know that's really what he's trying to say? Because of what verse he turns to, and he turns to Psalms 19. We'll come to that lastly on my list. And I know you think if all my points have all this many, you're really going to be here a long time. But this is the longest point, all right? But I really have to turn to some of these passages. I want you to hear what is the purpose of man. And I'm going to read them, and you can just listen to them, because I'm going to go more rapid. 
And the first one is Isaiah 55, 1 through 13, and I will not read every single verse, okay? I'm just going to skip through some verses, so that's why I say you might want to just listen. Verse 1, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat from me. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways your ways, are de declares the world, the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth. And so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts are, are not your thoughts. In verse 12, for you shall go out in joy. You see, everything they said and I was kind of trying to come up to is that what have I designed for you? What am I calling you to? I'm calling you. You are thirsty, thirsty man. Man is wanting something in life. He desires something and he's trying everything that there is. And he blames everyone that there is for not having what he wants in life. And he says simply here, he says, for you, when you come to me, you will go out in joy and you'll be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees in the fields shall clap their hands. Anything wrong, clap your hands in church. No. You see it here, you see it in the Psalms. Clap your hands, you people, and, and, and rejoice in the Lord. And he goes on and he finishes, says, make a name for the Lord. Now, that's really a neat passage. I want to turn to the next one is Psalms 33. He says, shout for the joy of the Lord. What's the purpose of man? What is the command that he's given there in, in chapter 33? Did you hear it? Shout for the joy of the Lord. Oh, you righteous Anybody saved here? Say amen. amen. Shout for joy. <laughs> See, some of you kind of hesitate. Do you really mean it? <laughs> Shout for joy. That's I'm just reading scripture, folks. And somehow we as Christians have, have gotten to a stagnant and stagnation where that we do not give glory to God. We do not shout for joy. That's how, like, oh, my, I'm afraid you're going to go into Pentecostal. You're going to start jumping a pew, and we're going to bring in snakes, and we're going to have, you know, next thing you know, they're going to be a snake pit over there. Yeah, no way. That's nothing. I'm scared of snakes, number one. <laughs> now in South Carolina, we had churches down there. I pastored down there, and we had churches that snake handled, and it was scary. They had snake pits in the church. And, you know, one of, my, one of my deacons in the church said, what would you do, Pastor, if you went to that church? I said, I'd find the nearest exit. And if there wasn't one, I'd make one through that wall. <laughs> you know, there's no way I'm fooling around with snakes. God gave me sense enough to stay away from them. All right. I mean, that's like saying I'm going to stand in front of the semi that's doing 70 miles an hour. And by faith, I'll stand here. Am I an idiot? You know, that's not faith. That's stupidity. You see, there's a difference there, folks. So he goes on, shout for joy, you righteous. Praise the benefits of the Lord. Sing to him a new song. Is there anything wrong with new songs? No, new songs are very important. They're taught in the scriptures. New Testament and Old Testament says we need new songs. I love the old hymns. I love new songs. I love them both. Sing and play skillful on the strings with loud shouts. Did you hear that band? At strings, this is God's instrument. You know, it used to be, I can remember years ago, oh, a guitar on the stage has to be an organ, has to be a piano. You know? No, the scripture said, you know this, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he has spoken, he came to me, he commanded, and he stood firm. Verse 13, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where they sit in thrones. He, he looks out on them and all the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 18, behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those that fear him. Verse 20, O oh, souls, wait for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. For our, ha our heart is glad in him. What is our purpose? What is our purpose? Because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love be upon us. Now, I know that's only two. I'll be, I'll be quicker now. Uh, the next one is Psalms 43. It's simply, then I will go out to the altar of the Lord, to God, my exceeding joy. God is my what? My joy. 
God is what? My love. God is what? My purpose. God is my everything. God is my sustainer. God is my all. Do you understand? What a difference from the world and where the world stands. See, that's what he's trying to teach us in these passages here. And in chapter, uh, or Psalms 37, did I mark that one? If I didn't, I will find it. Psalms 37 and verse 4. I know I have it somewhere. My there it is. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. Be befriend, befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. What is, the, what is the purpose once again? What's the command? Delight yourself in God. Find joy in God. Be glad in God. Shout for joy. Rejoice in him. Sing a new song. All these psalms do this exactly. They go one after another. Then this one in Isaiah, I love. In Isaiah 40, 43, 7. Everyone who calls by, is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Why were you created? For the glory of God. You see, that's contrary to what the world teaches, and that's contrary to what the world thinks. You were created for what? For your own enjoyment. You are created to, to achieve and do whatever you want. And you ask the average teenager, what do you want to do in life? Well, I want to, you know, I want to get this really cool job. I'm going to go get this education. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a home. I'm going to get a car. I, I want a Ferrari. I want this. And I want to go and I want to visit, you know, countries around the world. And I want to, 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 I want to. And they grow up to be 30 and 40 years old and they're still trying to achieve those things and they're finding their debts are still maturing <laughs> and they haven't paid for out and they haven't hit the million dollar, you know, mark that they wanted and they just keep wanting, I want to, I want to, I want to. And the Bible says you've missed it. You were created for the glory of God. Is there any other reason that you were created? According to the scriptures, no. And whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, see, I really put this back in our place here, doesn't it? Well, I want it. That's a surprise. You know, see, I, I, I want to do the glory of God. Whom, I see, says, I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You are my witness, declares the Lord. You are my witnesses. You that know the Lord, you that have been saved, you have found the forgiveness of sins. You are the witnesses of God to his, what? Glory. You're the witness. You're the one that goes out. You're the one that tells. You know, he didn't tell the angels to go out and witness because they never found redemption. They didn't have to go through. They weren't sinners that had to be saved. You and I are. He didn't tell the animals to rejoice. They aren't the ones being redeemed. We're the ones that need to be redeemed. And as we are redeemed, we are the witnesses. I, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. I declare and, to save, and save and proclaim. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will re not remember your sins. Why did he do it? Why did he forgive you? For his sake. Well, I thought it was for me. For his sake. For his glory, for his purpose. Boy, that kind of makes me kind of small, doesn't it? Amen. Yes, you are. There's nothing big and mighty about you. Everything, everything you do. I was, I was listening to a, a sermon by John Piper, and he said a few things, and I give him the credit because it really got me thinking. All men want to be happy. All men want to have joy in their life. You know, like Jesus said, I came that you might have life and you might have life abundantly. I, I want you to have life. I want you to have a happiness. I want you to have joy in your heart. Everything we do is ultimately to be happy. We work, we clean, we create to what? Have happiness, satisfaction. Yeah, you say, I don't work to be happy. Yes, you do. You work so you can accumulate, so you can buy what you want, and so, you, you know, you know, some say, ah, I just work to pay the bills. Yeah, because the alternative is live under the bridge. All right? 
And then you would rather not do that. You'd rather be happier than the hobo down under the bridge. And so you do do these things. You clean. Why do you clean? Because you don't want to live in a pig's pen. It feels good to be in a clean house, doesn't it? Clean the dishes. You say, this makes me feel good. I don't like doing it. Well, yeah, I know that, but that's the way it is, you know. We buy, we shop. Why do we do that? Because we think there's happiness in it. I got a new dress. Did you see my new shoes? You know, I got a new tie, you know. I got a new thing. Yeah, we, somebody, you know, do this. we enjoy doing that. Did you see the new car, you know. Everybody in church, you know, gets a new car. Did you see the new car? <laughs> you know, that's just kind of, it, it's us. That's part of us. We enjoy those things. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying those things. But if that's our ultimate, then there's something wrong. That's not where happiness is really totally found. We go out to eat. We go to movies. We watch TV. We, do, uh, we go to entertainment things and football games and this and that and everything. What? So we enjoy. So we just might suck in this enjoyment. And we think that that's going to make us happy. Many people do. Even the most miserable in life do things to try to be happy. The thief steals what? He steals so he can be happy. You know, the drug user, he uses the drugs what? So he can find a few moments of pleasure. Even I re- and when I heard this at first, it really kind of struck me, and I didn't, I didn't think about it before ever. John Piper said, you know, even the suicidal, the one who commits suicide does it for happiness to escape when he thinks that maybe finally he'll find relief from the pain of that life. You see, we do everything for happiness. We do everything to have some sort of joy. And joy is God's desire. That's what Isaiah 55 is trying to tell us there. That is God's desire. That's what Psalms 33, that is God's desire. I will go in Psalms 43, 4, I will go to the altar to God, my what? Exceeding joy. Joy is command. Psalms 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Psalms 34, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. We're created for the glory of God. That's the point. Ephesians, going to the New Testament, says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in and we we're created what as a workmanship of God. We are a piece of work, a furniture. He's the master builder so that what we might be to his praise, to his glory. Do you get it? That's the point that he's trying to say. Now, Paul says back to Romans. Paul says their voice has gone out, all the earth and all the wor- words to the ends of the world. Now, you see, the point is this, is that you and I, we, we, we don't think of, you know, the rest of the passage. Paul knew he was talking to a bunch of Jews and whatnot and people that knew the scriptures. They memorized. Why? Because they couldn't read. And so they would literally memorize chapter after chapter after chapter of the Old Testament. And you'd refer to a verse in Psalms 19. Oh, yeah, I know that passage. And you and I, us dummies, we, we, we don't. We have to carry a Bible and flip, 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 flip. We have maybe 12 verses that we might be able to memorize, you know, and quote. Well, they knew. So for the sake of us not being quite where they were at that time, I want to read to you the context of that verse that he quotes. He's quoting chapter 19, verse 4, but you need to read verse 1 to get to verse 4. And it says, the heavens declare, what? The glory of God. That is the title of that that passage of Psalms 19. That's the, the headline. Everything's going to explain that. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens do? Yeah. Everything on the stars, everything that we see, and you go out in the night air, you see it all says God. Because it just couldn't hang there from nothing. It couldn't be created from nothing. It couldn't just be a bang. It has to be God's bang. He spoke and it happened. There has to be a source. There has to be an author of it. I can't, I can't wear this watch and say it came from nothing. There has to be a source. So he goes on. 
The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Every day I look out and I look and I see the trees and the flowers. I, I see my puppy dog. I see a baby that's going to be born. And when I look at that and the first time I see it, I say, oh, that's God. Isn't it awesome? That's what he's saying here in this. You see, day to day it pours out. It just shouts there's a God. And night to night reveals knowledge. And night to night you think about the things that you've seen during, during the day. And it all says, look at God. Hopefully as a believer, night to night you sit down and, and you go to bed and you say, look how God took care of me today. Look how God provided for me today. I didn't deserve even the food and the shelter. That's what he's saying. That's what that verse literally means. Then he says, there is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. That's what he quotes in Romans chapter 10. The whole world shouts, God, glory. What's wrong with men? Haven't they heard it? Haven't they heard it? That's what he said. But I ask, haven't they heard? While all of nature's heard it, what's wrong with us? Our ears deaf? What's wrong that we don't hear it? That's the point that he's trying to say to us. So that brings us then to number two. But I ask, don't you understand what happens when man refuses God's purpose? Now that's my interpretation of the next verse. Verse 19. But I ask, did Israel not understand? Did they not get it? Israel. Why does he bring Israel? Because Israel was God's chosen people. Israel was chosen. Abraham was chosen. And he raised up a nation. And he did miracle after miracle. No other people of all the world ever saw the power of God like Israel did. And so then, as they saw the power of God, didn't they get it? Who gets the glory? Yeah. Now, that's the point that he's trying to make there in starting off. Don't, don't, didn't they understand what happens when you refuse God's purpose? Didn't Israel get it? You obey, you're blessed, you're fulfilled. There's happiness, there's joy in the land. They're protected and promises and fulfillment and prosperity came. When they disobeyed, what happened? Curses and emptiness and seeking and imaginations that went wild. Self-ambition, self-prospering, self-fulfillments, fightings and idols and emptiness. Uh, sounds familiar, doesn't it? And you see exactly what happens. The truth is the greatness, his greatness, his reputation, his honor is displayed when we glorify him. If we turn to other people and other things for our joy and for our satisfaction, we dishonor God. We de-glorify God. See, Romans 3, 23 says very clearly, for all have sinned and come short of a... You ever think about that? We come short of what? We come short of the glory of God. We come short of the what? Glory of God. Well, you see, the, the, there's a point to that and what he's trying to teach us. Paul that was, turns then to... Deuteronomy 32, 21, that's where the quote comes. We won't need to turn to it. He quotes it right here in verse 19. I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Well, what does that mean? Okay, I understand because at first you go, what? I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God is the beginning of that psalm. It's a, it's a song, Moses' song, and it comes down to a conclusion. Once again, he takes the concluding verse of the subject there, and it comes down to verse 21. He reminds them, he says, yeah, I will make you, I'll make you jealous. I will give them the joy to those who will accept. When it uses the term there, their voice has gone out to all the, whoops, uh, I will make you jealous to those who are not a nation, the word nation is the root word uh, in, in Greek. It's the same word as, as not a people, not my people. 
Uh, it doesn't mean the nation of Russia or necessarily anything of that nature. It means a people. He says, I will make you jealous by giving that joy that was intended for you to those who will accept it, that aren't my people, that may not be Jews. Gentiles will be able to have it. And the Jews kind of go, what do you mean? It's only for us. You see, and that, that's kind of the heart of the one of the things he wants to get to. The point is this. It's not all about you. When you make it all about you, you feel you you will feel discontented. You feel jealous about what others have. Yeah, you know, when a believer doesn't glorify God, it becomes critical. You ever notice that? When you stop praising God and giving Him the credit, you get critical. You get judgmental. You get jealous. You see other people getting ahead of you, and you say, well, "Why don't I get what they get?" Have you been there? We won't raise our hand. Jealous, jealousy is a powerful thing. What happened to Cain and Abel? It was jealousy. What happened to King Saul and David? Jealousy. And what was the end of both of them? Destruction of their lives. One found joy in giving God the glory, and the other one was trying to find glory and self-satisfaction. You know how it is. You know, when your kids are raising up, if you had two kids or more, or if you take care of your kids in the nursery, it works the same way. And this little kid right here finds a toy and playing with it and just having a great time. All the rest of the kids are looking at that saying, man, he's having so much fun with that. And so finally that kid just sets it down for a moment and turns to something else. And this kid comes along, picks it up. What happens to that kid? Hey! <laughs> I had it first, right? Isn't it amazing? And, you know, he says, that's what's going to happen to Israel. Now, that's what we'll come to tonight, just a little bit on that. He says, but you see, it works out in life that way, too. You see somebody else have something that's better than you have, and then suddenly you start looking at what you deserve and what you think you should have rather than giving glory to God for what you do have. Point. If you don't pick up on this, I'll just give it to another. That's what he was saying. So number three. So what's the conclusion? Romans 10, 20 to 21. This time he turns to, to Isaiah 65, 1 and 2. And this is an interesting passage. And he's gonna, first, he's going to divide it into two verses. Verse 20, 20 says, Then Isaiah is so bold to say, he's so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me, I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Whoa, really? Yeah. And, and to the Jew, that's, that was just a stab to their heart. And then in verse 21, but of Israel, he said, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. That's Isaiah 65, 1, and then verse 2. Paul turns to this, and he reads this, and we learn something from it. God's condemnation and judgment on sin is just. Israel, the punishment that you, you took and the punishment that came upon you was just and was fair. Every human created was created for the glory of God. And when you refuse that, then you come under the judgment and condemnation of God. Wow, are you kidding? You know, you're created to live for God. Well, I have a choice in doing that. Yes, you do have a choice in doing that. And until we see the essence of what sin is, sin, listen carefully, sin is not the abuse of people. Sin is the abuse of God. I've learned that through Psalms 51. When David had committed sin, he had committed murder and adultery and everything. Remember Psalms 51? Read it sometime. What does he come in conclusion? His conclusion in verse 4 is he says this, against you, and you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. No, he, he hurt people. He, he done this, he did this, and that, and, you know, and, and, and we were saying, he hurt me too, and, you know, he did this, and he did that. And David's going, no, 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 no. We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat in the same black cauldron of sin. You know who I really have hurt? You know where it all begins? You know where it all goes back? It goes back to the glory of God. 
so when I failed to give him glory, all this other, this is just incidental. This is just all the sidebar on that one scene. That's the only point. That's where it began. That's where it started. That's the point that I have to go back to. Well, he needs to go apologize this one. He needs to go apologize that one. He needs to go do this and this and this. No, you need to just go back and get back to God. When you get back to God, then you'll take the other things will be taken care of. It's not good how good you live and how much you know and, and all this. You see, here's one of the things I've learned. To some people, sin is not as serious as God thinks it's serious. Sin is not that serious. Hell is really ridiculous. So therefore, they say, I really don't believe in hell. And I can't believe in a God that believes in hell. To God, hell is not too much for sin. To man, hell is their overreaction to sin. I mean, after all, just say, I'm sorry, and, you know, let it be, right? I mean, this hell bit's kind of, you know, extreme, isn't it? That's kind of hateful, isn't it? But to God, it's an insult sin is to his glory. And the cross is not too much to save. In fact, it's the very minimum. To man, the cross is too gruesome, too bloody, too dramatic. It's an overkill. You understand? But when we, when we see sin as God sees sin, then we see that verse of Romans 3.23, for all of sin and come short, we've come short of the glory of God. We've come short, glory, the word glory is doxa in the Greek, and we get the word doxology, and doxology literally means a study of praise to God, glory to God, honor to God. You remember the doxology? When I was a kid, we sang it at the end of every service. Some of you remember how it goes? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And of course, Amen. Do you ever listen to the words carefully to that? The words were this, a doxology, is the science of doxology is summed up in, the, in that. Praise God, for he is the source of all blessings. Praise God, all creatures, everything here below. Praise him above, all ye in the heavenly host, all of heaven. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want to finish that in just a minute. You see, the outrage of man stiff arms God. The outrage of sin pushes off the creator, screams I'm going to do it my own way. Hell is just an overreaction. I don't believe in it. And we push it and push it, and the cross is too much. And we can are condemned under the weight of our own sin, our own selfish rebellion. And the Bible says clearly in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But then lastly, he says there in verse 21, all day long I have held out my hand. What a beautiful picture of God. Yeah, you, you see how ugly sin is? You see how horrible sin is? Do you see how patient God is? I love that. All day long, I held out my hand. Now, a day with God is a thousand years with man. It's just, you know, it's kind of neat. All day long, he holds his hand out. And I love that part about him. See the patience, see the steadfast love over the years. How often has he held out and just waited and 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 his arms are still. What does it say? All day long, I've held out my hand. I've opened, I have my arms are open wide. In order for one to go to hell, he has to push aside Jesus himself, 
march over the stained ground of the cross, step purposely over into the brink of darkness, purposely. Isn't that amazing? All day long, I keep standing there, and you've got to quicken your thought. I read this in, in that same uh, article of John Piper. He said this, and I never thought about it. The cry for help saves nobody. The cry for help saves nobody. You know, for a drowning man or injured or you're trapped or you're sick or you're lost in the forest, the cry for help doesn't save you. You're out in the middle of the forest somewhere and just yell, help, anybody hear me? doesn't save you. You ever think about that? It doesn't. What saves you is a lifeguard and a rope and a boat and an ambulance and a nurse and a doctor and a hospital and medical equipment. That's what saves you. Well, are you saying man saved? No, what I'm saying is this. It's the rescue program put into action, that team. Now, let me go back to the doxology. Praise Father, Son, and Holy God the Father, the creator of the universe in which everything is to be to his glory and to his praise, created you for his purpose. But man decides to change, and man rebels, and God the Son, part of the team now, stepped in and said, and I will take their sin. And I will die on the cross. And I will go the way. I will live with them. And I will take the abuse. And I'll take the rejection. I will do that. And God the Holy Spirit steps up and says, and I'll transform them from the inside out. I'll wash them clean. Praise God, Father, Holy Ghost. And the team is put into action when man cries out for help. It's not the cry of help that saves you. It's the team of the Trinity that saves you. All the cry for help does is connects you to that team. Whether it's in the forest or it's drowning in the, in the pool or the lake or wherever it is, it's the cry of help that connects you. But if you won't cry for help, the team can never reach you and reach out. That's the way it is. Trust into him with all your heart. Lean not to them own understanding. Trust he is the provider, that he can save you. Put your faith that he can do that. Placing your life into his hands for his glory. Whatever you do, do all for his glory. Whatever you do, do you place yourself into God's hands? Can you say honestly this morning, I want my life to the glory of God? Everyone is bowed and nobody's looking around. If that's true, saying yes, I offer myself to his glory, afresh, anew. I confirm it. Just stand right where you are. Yes, Lord. Yes, just stand right where you are. I offer myself to his glory. Lord, you, you see. We don't need to look around. This is just for us. Lord, we want to glorify you with our life. We want to praise you with our everything that we are. Lord, we renew once again. Help us, Lord. The world tries to distract us and we start to look at it ourselves and we start looking at what we want. We start looking at our own ambitions. And I need to be starting with you and saying, no, Lord, I, I want to glorify you. I want to glorify your name. I want to be to your praise. Lord, here I am. Use me to be the witness that you've created me to be. In Jesus' name.